the black constituency within the Democratic Party is analogous to the house Negro of the plantation under slavery. You know, basically what they what the Democrats did is they extended the offer of the house Negro to everybody on the plantation. They said, you know what? If you're willing, if you're willing to truly cast off any hope of ever being free, we'll let you come in the house. And you could serve us in here, and you'll still be our slaves. But you'll have nicer food, you'll have warmer beds, you'll have softer mattresses, you know. I mean, it, we'll, we'll provide for you. You'll have a nicer life. Uh, we had a holiday, uh, Martin Luther King Day. Yeah. There was some, this is, it's, it's, it's an interesting holiday for, for the Republicans. And because the Republican Party was founded by abolitionists who fought to end slavery and who fought for civil rights. And we have voting records of every single Democrat voting against civil rights, right? During the time of Martin Luther King, right? Republicans were bringing forward legislation. Republicans had the first black Congress people. And uh, I mean, we, we've been on the side of fighting for individual liberty. And I mean, at the very, when I go into schools and talk to kids and I don't really get super political, but I do talk about the two parties we have in this country and how Republicans believe in a republic, the constitutional republic, which means you can you can't just pass a law because you have a majority, but that that law must also be constitutional. We look to the Constitution, which limits government in a democracy. You can pass anything you want uh, as long as you have 50 percent plus one. And that's basic. That's the basis of the two parties. And when you have a democracy, it ignores the minority. Right. You're, you, you are just looking for what's best for the majority. And by by definition of these two parties, the Republican Party fights for the minority being, you know, the, the, the smallest minority being the individual. And right. that that's what's important to me. And when it comes to Martin Luther King and his words and, of course, bringing up critical race theory and, and, and having these conversations, man, it puts the Democrats on defensive all over the place, all over social media. And I did a pretty punchy video and made some comments about how in 60 years, um, you know, in, in, the, in the words of, of Martin Luther King, that, that he hopes to have his children will one day live in a country where they're not judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And tying that in with what we're seeing in, in schools today with critical race theory, actually judging people by the content, by the color of their skin and separating them by race, right. uh, it, it, it touched some nerves. Yeah, I mean, what has been done, and I, I write about this and speak about this every year on MLK Day, what has been done with the legacy of Martin Luther King is bastardization. It is infiltration. It is corruption. It is co-opting. They've taken the, the image of Martin Luther King. And they have twisted it into something that he never expressed, never believed in, and would have opposed. How do I know that? How do I know where a dead man would have stood on the issues of today? Well, because I know where he stood on the issues of his time. And it was in stark contrast with everyone around him. All right. There's a reason why we celebrate. Martin Luther King Jr. Day and not Malcolm X Day or <laughs> or Al Sharpton Day or Jesse Jackson Day or Black Panthers Appreciation Month. OK, there's a reason why MLK stands out and is uniquely honored and uniquely revered. And the reason is he was preaching in the midst of militant social agitation that was dominated by communists and Marxists and, and folks who did not actually, they were using the issue of race and the issue of segregation as a catalyst to achieve not justice, but to push their agenda, their anti-American agenda, 
to to further agitate and further balkanize and further divide the country to the benefit of the Reds, who are watching it all and fostering it all from their perches overseas. MLK frustrated that effort because he came on the scene and he said, no, 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 no. I'm not interested in in a black nationalism. I'm not interested in getting revenge on the white man. I'm interested in this dream I have, this vision I have for a future where little white kids and little black kids can play together and it's no big deal. Where my four black children are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He referred, you go back and you listen to that whole speech, which is a worthy thing to do. Go back and listen to the entirety of his I Have a Dream speech from 1964. He he talks about he talks about justice. He doesn't talk about social justice. He talks about actual justice. He makes all sorts of biblical references. He he refers to his white brothers and sisters. What critical race theorist? What modern woke black activist talks about their white brothers and sisters? They might talk about allies in a patronizing fashion. That is very similar. You remember that scene in uh, the Denzel Washington Malcolm X biopic where he's coming down the stairs and this white student, f- female student comes up to him and is like, oh, I love you, you know, Mr. X. And I just want to know, is what can I possibly do to help the cause? And he looks at her and he goes, nothing, and then walks past her. That's how today's modern critical race theorists and wokesters feel about their white allies. They, they look at them and they're like, that's cute, but we're coming for you too eventually, right? Martin Luther King was a contrast to that. And what he sold was bought enthusiastically by the American people. Why? Because he would, because he had truth on his side, because he was advocating for actual justice. And because the, the vision, the dream that he was outlining had inherent common value that did not, it didn't take from this group in order to give to that group. It was a restoration. It was a reconciliation. It was the idea that we, we only have things to gain from each other, not things to lose. And so we need to tear these barriers down to allow us to come together in relationship, in brotherhood, in fraternity, in order to build a better tomorrow. That was Martin Luther King. That message in the Democratic Party today, that message in the midst of critical race theory, that message with your your woke neighbor, your woke professor would be rejected and has been rejected. His message has been rejected. They still stick their hand and work his mouth like a puppet and pretend, oh, this is our guy, MLK. He was for us, but he wasn't. It's a bastardization. It's a damn shame. It's, it's, it's horrific what they've done to his legacy. And Republicans and conservatives should be doing a lot more to reclaim it. A lot more. Well, I'm certainly trying, man. And uh, there, no, I, I get saw that and I appreciate it. I, I get in a fight online with some with some Democrats, especially some older Democrats. And Jack Considine, who was uh, was a retired rep from uh, Mankato, or just retired last year, um, he, he likes to jump on and talk about how um, things that I talk about with liberty and, and freedom, how that's actually their party, and that that our party switched right around the time of Martin Luther King. Like it was it was the Republicans that were the old Democrats in the South, and then all of a sudden. Yeah. Everything like in one year just switched, switched sides after the Civil Rights Act. And then the Republicans became or the Republicans became the, the Democrats and the Democrats became the Republicans. And um, like, no, you can't. The whole philosophy of our parties are have been the same, you know, With, they're, they're still fighting for the same things they were fighting for them. They, they are still going after segregation. They want it. They want racial segregation. They are still going after enslaving people. They want it. They want to tell you what to do. They want to force you to live your life according to their values, not your own. I mean, nothing has changed. They, they, you know, you know what they did? Here's what changed after 1964. The old racists in the Democratic Party realized 
that they, they realized that they were no longer going to be able to, to be Orwell's 1984 on race. They were going to have to be Huxley's Brave New World. And that's what they immediately – you look at the rise, the advent and rise of critical race theory. When did it happen? Not too long after MLK was no longer on this earth. I don't think that's a coincidence. They went back to the drawing board and they said, you know, we're not going to be able to do Jim Crow anymore because that's too explicit. And we're not going to be able to go around in white hoods riding on horses anymore because that's too overt. We need to figure out a way. If, if we really want to achieve the ends of race, racism, which what are the ends? If you're, if you're the white man, if you're in the majority, if you're the man, and you want to truly, effectually subjugate black people, well, how, do you, how can you do it? it expand if, welfare. It, yeah, Give, right, get them well, on food stamps. Beat them, beat them down. Dole out crack. You know, right. keep, people, keep people addict. And and on top of that, create a a narrative that they will buy into that keeps them on the hook. You know, basically what they what the Democrats did is they extended the offer of the House Negro to everybody on the plantation. They said, you know what? If you're willing, if you're willing to truly cast off any hope of ever being free. We'll let you come in the house and you could serve us in here and you'll still be our slaves, but you'll have nicer food. You'll have warmer beds. You'll have softer mattresses. You know, it will we'll provide for you. You'll have a nicer life. It used to be like functionally, practically, you could only do that for a handful of people on the plantation, but they figured out a way to offer that to everybody. You could all be the house Negro now. And that's where we're at. The Democratic Party, the black constituency within the Democratic Party is analogous to the House Negro of the plantation under slavery. That is the function they serve. They serve their master and make apology for him and are, and are willing to take a bullet for him to protect him because he provides them with warmth and comfort and security. And the the opiate of not having to worry because he's going to take care of you. There, there are very few of us left out here um, who – and you know who we are because you know, we're the ones like, like Candace Owens, not to put myself on her level, but you know, Candace Owens, me, there are a couple other people in town here in the state um, who are not seeking – that comfort and want to be judged by the content of our character and not by the color of our skin. And it's not because it's easy. It's because it's honest. <laughs> I want, I don't, I don't want to be comforted. I want to be affirmed for what I actually am, for what I'm actually bringing to the table. I don't want to, I don't have the sense of belonging to something. I want to have authentic association, authentic relationship and authentic identity. And you can't have that as somebody else's property, which is what the democratic constituency, uh, black constituency is today. They, they are, they are claimed to, to the point where they, there are things there and they're being there. Look, we just, what do we just talk about? Um, as, as a black person in the twin cities, or actually the state of Minnesota statewide, you can't caucus if you haven't been vaccinated and don't have proof of it. Well, black people disproportionately are not vaccinated. So the democratic party has just told you, you ain't welcome. Sorry. Maybe you could phone in. Yeah. Maybe you could do it online. Good luck being a delegate. And so th this is the moment for, for black listeners within the democratic party this is the moment for you to call into question do these people actually care about me these these people actually have my best interests at heart or are they just using me as their property to advance their political agenda yeah, and, they, and i made that argument when i shared that the dfl uh caucus call about um requiring to be vaccinated saying that the that the black community and the immigrant community have the highest percentages of people that are not vaccinated why 
because they don't trust government, because they don't trust government uh, like us, like Republicans. But it's unfortunate in Walter. So I'm, you know, sincerely wish you a uh, happy Martin Luther King Day. I think it was a good celebration. We we stirred the pot. We poked the we poked the right people and started a good conversation instead of just putting out a uh, a blase meme. Uh, yeah, on, right. on Martin Luther King <laughs> choosing. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, I have. On my Facebook page, when I log in as that page, I have, you know, I follow, I don't know, several hundred people, organizations, a lot of them, but every organization and oh, candidate yeah. and everything oh, puts yeah. out the same blase thing. Right. And I, I worked over the weekend to, to cut a video, just basically coming right at critical race theory. And yeah. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make a statement that's bold and remind people what we're fighting for. And, and, and I have to call this out.